It was May 1940. The Allied French and British forces had been badly defeated by Germany in the Battle of France. Around 350,000 soldiers, including the entire British Army, were backed up against the sea at a port in a town called Dunkirk. This was along the coast of France. They were sitting ducks. Their days were numbered. They were certain to be wiped out at any moment by the enemy. 350,000 men, it was far too many, more, more men than they had ships to carry them back to England. And the Germans were certain to press their advantage. They were, had planes, and all they had to do was fly those planes over those beaches and drop their bombs and strafe the men, and they would be entirely wiped out. The British commander at Dunkirk issued a cryptic three-word message to the people of England. And that message said, but if not, but if not, it was a reference to the three Hebrews in the book of Daniel who refused to bow to King Nebuchadnezzar's image. They said, the God we serve is able to save us, but if not, we will not bow. And this was a message of courage and defiance against impossible odds. The king of England, he issued a call for prayer. He issued a call for help. And miraculously, the weather forecast changed, and Germany often had to keep their planes grounded they, because they couldn't fly them over. There was, it, the weather was too bad, and soon, nearly 800 fishing boats and yachts and merchant vessels joined the British Navy to ferry out those 350,000 soldiers to safety over the course of 10 tense days. To this day, <clears throat> it is called the miracle at Dunkirk. It turned certain annihilation into a reason for hope. Apparent victims lived to fight another day, and they were eventually victorious. It is a story that still defines and inspires the people of the British nation. And as we think about stories and the power that they have to inspire and encourage people, certainly as the people of God, we understand that God's word and the stories in the Bible are also stories that define and inspire us today. They explain from where we've come. They shed light on who we are, and they guide our steps as we move forward in the future. Well, we're in message three of our series, The Bible and Our Journey to God. In the first message, we looked at Abraham and Isaac, and we saw how God is taking us on a journey from death to life. In the second message, last week, we looked at the life of Rahab, and we saw how God is taking us on a journey from slavery to freedom. Today, we look at the life of Daniel, and we are going to see how God is taking us on a journey from victim to victor. Now Daniel's story is one, it is the story that inspired that three-word cable from the beaches of Dunkirk, but if not. In the book of Daniel, we encounter the setting of a time when the entire nation of Israel was reduced to nothing. In fact, their cities and towns were turned to rubble, and their people were victims of a ruthless ruling empire named Babylon. But God was working through a plan to bring them salvation. He was working to transform them from victims to victors. And did you know that God has something similar in mind for each one of us today? He wants to transform you and I from victim to victor. The stories in the book of Daniel give us some inspiring insights into how God's great salvation is able to do just that, to change you from a victim to a victor. And so we're going to look at some of these insights, and we're going to see that, just like Daniel, we are on a journey, too. The first insight from Daniel is this. Number one, victory is mine because God is in heaven. You need to turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, it's one of the four major prophets in the Old Testament. You'll find Psalms, you'll find Proverbs, you'll find some other books there. Then you'll see Isaiah, another big book in the Old Testament, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. That's where we see that victory is mine because God is in heaven. He still rules. He is real. The Old Testament's book of Daniel is named for the main figure in the story who was one of many exiles 
who was forcibly taken from their homes in Jerusalem when King Nebuchadnezzar conquered them. When that happened in 586 BC, Judah ceased to exist as a nation as they were absorbed into this Babylonian empire. But even though he was more than 500 miles away from home, and even though he was amongst people who neither knew or worshipped his God, Daniel's story was just beginning. Daniel was a young man at the time of his exile, and yet he became an advisor to the very king who tried to make victims of him and his people. It is truly an amazing story. In Daniel chapter 2, we read about a time when the king had a disturbing dream, and he had no idea what that dream meant. And so he appealed to his advisors, and he said, I need you to tell me what this dream is, and tell me what it means. But no advisor of the king could tell him what the dream meant. And so Nebuchadnezzar, out of his frustration and anger, he issued an order to kill all of his advisors, and Daniel was one of those advisors. But we know that Daniel was not only able to tell the king what he had dreamed, he was able to also tell the king what his dream meant. And we know that that could only come from God, right? The God who is in heaven. And so Daniel told Arioch, the king's executioner, when he was standing right on Daniel's very doorstep, ready to kill him, Daniel told Arioch that he could interpret the king's dream. And in Daniel chapter 2, verses 25 through 28, here's what happened next. It says... Arioch took Daniel to the king and at once said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery that he has asked about. But... There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what is to happen in days ahead. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, Daniel says. In other words, God is real. He can do this. And because of that truth, you and I do not need to be victims. You and I do not need to resign ourselves to our current circumstances, no matter how impossible they might seem. You don't have to settle for the status quo, just like Daniel didn't have to settle for the status quo. What did he do? He faced that royal decree. He faced that kingly contract that was out on his life, and he said to him, but there is a God in heaven. Now, you may feel like your situation, no matter what situation you're in, is an impossible situation. But I want you to know this. There is a God in heaven. You may feel that you are burdened by sin and it is keeping you down. Or you are feeling burdened by sickness and, or an operation and it's facing you. But I want you to know this always. Remember, there is a God in heaven and he will see you through that. You may see no way to improve your dead-end marriage or your dead-end job or your dead-end finances or your dead-end life, but I want you to know that there is a God in heaven who will see you through those circumstances and walk with you every step of the way. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he can redeem you from your past and he can give you boldness and confidence for the future. There's another insight about this journey we're on with Daniel, which takes us from being a victim to being a victor. And that is number two, victory is mine because God delivers. We need to look into Daniel chapter 3 to see this insight played out. We can be victorious because God delivers. This chapter tells us the unforgettable story of this golden image that the king had made. This was a humongous image made of gold. It was 90 feet tall, the Bible tells us. That's as tall as a nine-story building. And he issued a command that everyone in his kingdom had to bow down and worship that image. And everyone did, <clears throat> except for three Jews whose Babylonian names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They did not bow. And that's where we pick up the story in Daniel chapter 3 with verse 13. And we're going to read through verse 23. 
It says, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, surprised you didn't have an electric guitar in there, John. <laughs> If you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we still will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you've set up. <laughs> then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. The Bible tells us that. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into that blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. And the king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up the three men and firmly tied, they fell into the blazing furnace. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this like this before, but you know, you and I are sometimes in a, a position very similar to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where things heat up quickly, right? And it's not pleasant to be in a situation like that. We too, sometimes, as children of God, find ourselves in situations where we are filled with stress or worry or anxiety. We, too, sometimes face difficult choices that we have to make. You see, we, too, have to decide between compromise and conviction, don't we? In Massachusetts a couple of years ago, Catholic foster care and adoption agencies were put out of business because the state of Massachusetts told them that they had to adopt their babies and children out to same-sex couples, even though it went against what those Christian adoption agencies believed God called them to do, and even though they didn't believe that doing so would be in the best interests of those children, those adoption agencies closed their doors rather than go against their convictions. Right now, the state of Michigan legislature is debating and formulating religious protections for Christian foster care and adoption agencies in our state who have convictions that it would be wrong and not in the best interests of children to put them into same-sex households. These adoption agencies, they're not being hateful. They're not being mean-spirited. They are simply living and operating by biblical convictions and social research that shows kids do best in homes where there is a loving mom and a loving dad. And so there are times, aren't there, where we have to figure out and decide if we're going to compromise our beliefs and our convictions or if we're going to live them and stand by them. Let's see how this episode for Daniel concludes. Look at Daniel chapter 3, verses 24 through 30. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace, and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Now that's just incredible. There was no smell of fire on them. 
I mean, who puts that kind of detail into a story if that didn't really happen? You know what I'm saying? To me, that little detail, kind of said in passing, just adds credibility that this thing really took place and happened. You know, we have a wood stove at our house, and whenever I put logs into that wood stove, it, it, it never fails. I have to wash my hands afterwards because they smell like smoke just from putting a log into a wood stove. These guys were in the fiery furnace. They were in the fire. They didn't even have a smell of smoke on them. This was truly a miracle of God taking place. But let's go on with the text. It says, the Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel, rescued his servants. And they trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. And then look down to verse 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now I just have to say that this story isn't a guarantee that you and I will never have to endure injury or pain or that we will never go through times of suffering. In fact, I think John just brought it up this morning in his meditation. Think of the many Christians in Muslim countries right now who are dying at the hands of ISIS. This past January, 21 Christians were beheaded by Muslims just because they were Christians. They were labeled by Muslims as people of the cross. And they were beheaded for that. More recently, only about a week and a half ago, you probably saw this in the news. Twelve Christians were thrown off of their boat in the Mediterranean Sea by the Muslims as they were fleeing the atrocities and violence of Libya to try and find a new start in Italy, right? These Muslims who were in charge of the boat, they, they threw these Christians off simply because they were followers of Jesus Christ. Fifteen Muslims were arrested by the Italian authorities and for their horrendous crime all 12 of those Christians drowned in the Mediterranean Sea. So we know through our own experience, and we know through God's word also, that just because things went well for Daniel and his friends that day, it doesn't mean that things always go well for us. But we do cling to the promises of Scripture that tell us God cares and He loves us and He will make things right in the end. And I think of Scriptures like Psalm 34, verses 17 and 18. It tells us how God is faithful in one way or another. Listen to these words. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them, and he delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in their spirit. And so whether God delivers us from our troubles now, or whether he saves us in the next life to come, be assured of this, God hears your cries, and he's close by. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's faith in God was resolute. They did not waver. They said to the king, God is able to deliver us, but if not, we will not bow to your idols. They knew that no matter how this worked out, that God is real, that God cares, and eventually he will make things right. I suggest to you that it was in that moment when they became victors, not when they walked out of the fiery furnace the next day. It was their trust in God. It was their obedience to him that brought confidence and strength to their souls and to their lives. And you and I, we can have that same kind of confidence because our God is able to save and deliver us too. In fact, we see that truth brought out over and over again throughout Scripture. He was able to save the whole nation of Hebrews when they were slaves in Egypt and Moses led them out. He was able to save the kingdom of Israel from their enemies over and over again, the Philistines and Edomites and Moabites. And he is able to save and deliver you and I today, right here, right now. He is able to do things for you that you cannot do for yourself. He is able to do things with you that you can't even imagine in your wildest dreams. So let me just kind of sum up where we're at in our message so far. What insights have we gained from Daniel so far today? Well, in Daniel chapter 2, we've seen I can be victorious because God is in heaven. In Daniel chapter 3, we've seen that I can be victorious, or I am victorious, because God delivers. 
I want us to check out one more insight from Daniel as we take this journey from victim to victor. Number three, victory is mine because God sent Jesus. I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 6 to see this insight played out. God sent Jesus. You know, years later, after Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon had been conquered by a new king, a new empire, Daniel was still serving in the royal courts. He was still faithfully praying to God. In fact, the Bible tells us three times daily. But others among the court officials, they resented Daniel because Daniel was a foreigner in their government. And Daniel not only still had influence in the government, but his influence was growing and they became resentful of that. So these officials, they plotted against Daniel to try and get him out of there. And they convinced the king, whose name was Darius, to proclaim a 30-day period in which no one could pray to any other name than that of the king. 30 days. I know maybe someone here is thinking, I could go 30 days without praying. <laughs> maybe there's someone else here who's going, I always do go 30 days without praying. What's the big deal? But these plotters knew that Daniel wouldn't or couldn't do that. And they were right. Even after that decree was signed, Daniel continued his three times a day prayer habit without missing a beat. And so the king, even though he liked Daniel, even though he was getting ready to promote Daniel, he knew he had to enforce his own law. And as punishment, Daniel was thrown into a den of lions overnight. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in the lions area at a zoo when it's feeding time. If not, let me just kind of fill you in. When fresh meat is thrown into the lions, they don't waste any time. They get down to business. Like some of us at the Ponderosa All You Can Eat Food Buffet. <laughs> they get down to business. But after the king suffered a sleepless night, I love what the Bible says about this. Daniel chapter 6, verses 19 through 23. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and he hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel! Servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God has sent his angel. And he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I done anything wrong before you, O king. And the king was overjoyed, and he gave orders to lift Daniel up out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. I want you to look again at verse 22. Daniel says, my God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. My God sent. Daniel was saved because God sent someone. Do you realize that that is true for you and me? We can say the same thing, except that in our case, God didn't just send us an angel. He sent us someone greater than an angel. He sent his own son, Jesus. Because when we couldn't go up to him, he came down to us. The most familiar verse in all the Bible puts it like this. Say it with me. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. John 3.16. One of the most impressive characteristics of the first century church was its courage in the face of intense op opposition. Their faith gave them a new perspective about all of life. Everything that they looked at about the world, they saw differently because of what Jesus had done for them. Even though Christians were often victims of a harsh and brutal Roman government, they lived as the victors that they were. They didn't easily take offense when someone slighted them. They didn't stomp their feet and throw a hissy fit when their rights were violated or someone offended them in some way or another. They knew that no matter what happened to them in this life, they were loved by God and they would live eternally with Him both now and forever. And so they spoke the truth about God in love, but they also spoke the truth about God with boldness. And as we start to wrap things up here, I just want to ask you a question right now. Who are you when things don't go your own way? Are you a victim or are you a victor? 
You see, we live in a time that calls for boldness. So stop your whining. We live in a time that calls us to do the right thing no matter what the rest of the world is doing. I want to share with you the story of one man who decided he was going to live boldly for Christ as a victor. He was a German theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In 1939, at the start of World War II, he openly expressed opposition to the policies of Adolf Hitler when most other German ministers at the time were intimidated into silence. When one of his radio sermons was cut off in mid-sentence, he knew right then and there that he was in serious danger, and so he fled to America where he was invited to speak in the leading pulpits of the Western world. But eventually Bonhoeffer became convicted that he had abandoned his people at their hour of need, and he wrote that he needed to live through the difficult period in his nation's history with his people or he would lose his right to encourage them in rebuilding their nation after the war was over. And so he went back to Germany, boldly preaching the truth of the gospel, and he was imprisoned in April of 1943. Two years later, in April of 1945, when the war was nearly over, Hitler gave orders for him to be hanged, and he died. Before he returned to his homeland, Bonhoeffer had said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Here's a man who understood what those words mean. What does that mean for us? Well, it means when we give our allegiance to Jesus Christ, <clears throat> we die to our rights. It means that when we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we give up and die to our whims. We give up and die to our preferences because our allegiance is to Jesus, the Christ who died for us. And we know that we are victors because death could not keep Jesus in the grave. So we live for him now, knowing that we will live with him in heaven forever when we see him face to face. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 through 57 says, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord, Jesus Christ. And in 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, we read, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcame the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So my friends, I can be victorious over temptation and sin because God sent Jesus. And I can be victorious over shame and guilt because God sent Jesus. I can be victorious over death and the devil because God sent Jesus. I can be victorious over all evil and the filth in this world because God sent Jesus. I can be victorious in the face of people's challenges and opposition because God sent Jesus. And you too can be victorious in all of this and more. Why? Say it with me. Because God sent Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the victory that is ours in Jesus Christ. Please help us each one to live in constant awareness of that fact. And I pray especially for those among us who've forgotten that. Who maybe aren't feeling very victorious right now. Maybe those who are facing threats or challenges in one way or another. Those who are passing through the fire, those who feel the enemy stalking them like a lion, those who are facing physical ailments or operations. I pray, Father, that you will give them your grace and help us all to live moment by moment and day by day as more than conquerors because that's who we are in, in our Lord. May we realize that in Jesus we are victors. We owe him our lives. We give him our allegiance. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, we read, You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who have been baptized in Christ have clothed yourselves with him. Three verses down, verse 29, it goes on to tell us that we are heirs according to the promise if we do that. Will you receive God's salvation by believing in Jesus and by being baptized into him today? Victory is yours for the taking because Jesus already did the work that makes yours and my victory possible.